before the alpha, a lot of people confused about that. The reason why they're confused is the um, uh, University Medical Center of Kernighan, uh, for about eight years, paid 20% of my salary to claim that they had one of the uh, most cited psychologists in the Netherlands on their faculty. And all I needed to do was just list them as my uh, affiliation of my publications. Um, so I, I didn't know it was going to be here. I thought it was going to be another panel with Lou last week. And um, I got an invitation. And Dave Professor Coyne, um, uh, the, uh, the Dutch Behavior Therapy Association, thought I, I lived in the Netherlands. And they thought I could just come over and do a talk. As it was, I was traveling through. And I said, sure. And uh, normally, when I t I'm not a behavior therapist, although I often give talks to behavior therapists as kind of a critic in t debate, and I get paid lots of money. This time, they're asking me to come for free, they, they allow me to have a free afternoon attendance, uh, admission to the conference. And I thought, well, uh, it, it's very important, I'll do that. And then, right afterwards, the word got out that I was coming, and the cognitive behavior therapist panicked. And they said, I'm very sorry to inform you that unfortunately we have to pull back the invitation to debate out of Congress. We were looking forward to hear about your view on uh, CBT ME, but our main goal is to organize respectful and balanced debate. Based on further information and previous experiences, we feel obliged to search for another candidate. And so then Lou pulled out of, out of the conference. And uh, I'm not sure, did anybody go? I think it, the the panel collapsed. Um, a little bit about me. Um, when they had the high tribunal in the UK about release of the PACE data to um, uh, Eltham uh, Matthews, Ellen Matthews, um, they only allowed the PACE investigators a very short time to speak. And Trudy Chalda got up and she put a, a, a slide of a tweet for me and she said, this is the kind of person that will get a hold of our data if we release it to the patients. It will cause severe reputational damage. That's why we can't do it. And uh, the, the tribunal ruled that that's exactly why if, if people of my uh, accomplishments wanted to look at the data, it should be made available. And so they released the data. I myself was involved, in, and uh, Alan only asked for a small portion of the data. <coughs> And um, I asked for the rest, the whole data set, because the PLOS investigators, excuse me, the PACE investigators, had published in a journal called PLOS One, where I was an editor. And we had a requirement that if you publish there, you have to, you have to promise to make your data available. And so I said to them, okay, give me your data. And we got in a long battle that took years, and we, I didn't get the data, but I got a, a warning note on there paper saying that they had not complied uh, with the uh, practices. So uh, I've come sort of pre-hated. And um, last year, I was, I was also passing through Europe, and I was going to Tuscany for my birthday. And um, uh, I spoke at another unrest gathering. And at the end of the gathering, there were two women uh, just hugging and crying at the back of the room. And I was on my way out to dinner, but it really struck me. Uh, we'd had the movie, we had the um, panel, and I said, uh, excuse me, uh, could I give some assistance? And they said, uh, uh, one had started, the other one had to finish for her. They said, we're two physicians, uh, we're GPs, and we just stumbled into this uh, movie tonight, and the panel, and we're crying because of all the harm we've done to patients. We never realized it by doubting the patients, by suggesting that it was in their head. And uh, I said, well, um, and I said, what can we do? I said, I don't know. But I, I think that um, it's very important that you've come to this realization and maybe we get some other people to the realization. Uh, uh, in a couple days, uh, actually, I leave tomorrow at 7 a.m. to give a, a TEDx talk in Slovakia on um, um, mindfulness about is it just a placebo? 
and I'm a known critic and I'm a known skeptic. And um, um, <laughs> then I go back to Ireland. I just pop around Europe. I, I love the budget flights once you get over here. You can't stop. My wife and I consider ourselves digital nomads. And, but I'm going to Ireland. It's very important to me. Because the psychologist of <coughs> with Brian Hughes, and he says, I know nothing about chronic fatigue syndrome, but I saw your writings about the PACE trial. And I got so worked up about it, I put a chapter in my book on it. And it turns out that he just gave a, a presentation to David Tuller and in uh, Northern Ireland. And it's only a couple weeks old. There have been 10,000 views. And so uh, these sort of uh, uh, outreach are very important to me. Um, I don't have any in my, anyone in my family with chronic fatigue syndrome. I came into the whole activism, the whole debate, as an example of terribly bad science that needed it with a conflict of interest. Um, when I entered the battle in October uh, 2015, I wouldn't say I was close friends with Michael Sharp, but I owed him two bottles of wine because he had bought the last two one night arguing about something. I wouldn't say I was a, a close friend of Trudy Chalder, but um, she owed me a dinner. And um, uh, Simon Wesley and I were in regular correspondence. I had spent a, uh, six months as a Carnegie Centenary Visiting Professor in Scotland, and I, I was charged with going out and doing pub talks, grand rounds, things like that. And so I got really connected, and uh, I lost an awful lot of friends once I entered into this. I've been vilified, but I think that goes with the, the territory. And um, so I really wanted the opportunity. challenging him to a debate, a uh, member of the Dutch Health Council. And now he's claiming, uh, I guess last year, the PACE investigated included CBT leads to decreased levels of fatigue and overall improvement of well-being. Based on supplementary analyses, they included a subgroup of patients made a full recovery. They were curing um, chronic fatigue patients. And I say chronic fatigue because in the Netherlands, what you study, what you treat, is not a chronic fatigue syndrome. It's chronic fatigue. It's tiredness. The criteria are so loose, they include so many patients. They fill their clinics with people who don't have the diagnosis. Very often, it's comorbid um, de depression they're treating. Give me a little bit about my background. I, if you would ask me in 1990s, or if you ask my colleagues and say, Jim Coyne, is the person on the, in the psychiatry department that if you want chronic fatigue to be treated, he's excellent, he gets people moving. The, the situation was, and I, I, I actually ended up doing a lot of harm, but let me explain how I got that reputation. I was attached to a specialty mood disorders unit, and we get people who were chronically depressed, people that had to be two years depressed without any response to treatment. We bring them on the specialized unit, We'd take them off all their meds, they had lots of meds, and then they'd rebuild the, the, their medications and see which worked. And, and we had permission from the insurance company for extended stays, which aren't possible anymore. Many of these people had, were, their lives were devastated because they just couldn't do anything. They often complained of tiredness, but it was kind of a, a lead tire, tiredness. Um, it, it, was, it was a different quality to it. I would give them small tasks to get them going. Um, something simple. Um, you can see me as soon as you go out and find the name of four dogs tied up to the fire hydrant, uh, fire up to the parking meters. <coughs> the idea just get them moving and take your time. And of course, you don't talk to the dogs, you talk to the, the owners. Little tasks like that. Or here's, here's a napkin, pull some Kleenex out bring me four pieces of cheese from a, uh, a gathering that uh, you want to go to. Just simply go in there, get the 
cheese and say, and anybody asked, what are you doing? He said, sorry, I'm bringing this to Dr. Cohen, I can't stay. And the result, keeping the task very small, challenging, and amusing. The, the, the press people would grumble that they do it and, 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 um, and then get moving again. So the word got out, that, and some of my um, colleagues started writing papers about chronic fatigue syndrome. The criteria were so loose back there, we didn't know. So then we started getting referrals from rheumatology. Started doing the same thing. These were patients coming in a different referral route. There were different kinds of patients. I gave them the assignments, I got the same smiles and excitement, and I, 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 I called the patient, the patients called me, that was wonderful, it was so helpful, bam, uh, uh, a couple days later, they'd be on their back. And I just thought, well, what, that's strange, what, I, I don't understand. And I, and I had a few patients like that before I got frightened of getting more referrals from rheumatology, because it was a different referral, they were seeing a different class of patients. Our patients were predominantly melancholic depression, who were coming out of that, their lives were in shambles, they were very exhausted, <coughs> uh, they had uh, non-restorative sleep, but they were, they were entirely different. And uh, I stopped seeing any patients from rheumatology after that. But I had no idea because we didn't have the diagnostic criteria to capture the experience. Okay, so I really want to to get uh, Cleage in a debate, and he has, he has a lot of illusions. I, I, I don't know, I can't believe that he believes some of the things he says. They're so ridiculous. I mean, I don't know what to say about that, but uh, clearly he does not expect to be challenged. And, you know, I'm an American, we challenge people. And, um, I thought we would have a debate, and obviously he doesn't want to have a debate. And, um, and so, you know, how he gets away making these claims, the PACE trial is an unblinded trial with subjective self-report measures. Um, under the conditions in which the PACE trial was done, homeopathy would look good. Uh, and I've, I've done some, I've, I've, my TED talk, uh, coming up on, on, on Sunday, we actually talk about how homeopathy looks good uh, when you have, there's a lot of attention being given to the patient. They'll talk to a patient for two hours before they give them some inert substances. There's nothing in those capsules. There's nothing in that, the water. But they, they talk to you for two hours. People really like that. And they, they have subjective improvement, often better than in routine care. The GP only talks to them for five minutes. And, and so, and uh, it, it largely it's non-specific factors. Furthermore, um, there was switched outcome. And um, but what I think is really dodgy, the Dutch people use that word dodgy. Yeah, is that um, the Dutch Health Council has three studies with objective data, and they're hiding the data. You have to go in and look for it. And all of those studies show no objective improvement from the um, cognitive behavior therapy or from the exercise um, therapy. And uh, like I said, uh, this design would make homeopathy look good. And uh, the switching of outcomes, the originally proposed outcomes um, are, the, are the ones uh, in, in orange. The, the, the switched outcomes are the ones in blue. And uh, a patient, and you can see, there's very little difference between the control group, SMC, um, the exercise group, and the CBT. But they look huge. And what everybody's improving if you use the uh, other outcomes. Now, Mark Fink is a patient, and he's a physician. And uh, I really recommend his blog post, uh, the article he wrote, about testing himself by the criteria, and he found that uh, uh, when he at, at one point he would have um, been ineligible because he was too severe to be in the trial. Once they switched, he would have considered to, he would have been entered as a success, and um, and then he would basically um, you can get any result you want, yet he'd still be eligible, cured 
by the criteria. It just shows what a shambles it is once you start playing with the outcomes that way. I recommend the article. It's, it's, it's very readable. It's very good. Okay, that's the, this is the hidden paper. If you go find this paper, he stuffed all the data in, in the paper. But um, basically, um, if you do a tigraphy, I used to do a tigraphy studies with uh, cancer patients to find out what woke them up in the middle of the night, so the prostate patients, was it uh, the, the hot flashes they were having, or was, or was it cold? Uh, and, um, it's an objective measure of activity. You wear them. They put them on um, patients in their studies, but then they hit all the data because they didn't. Uh, it didn't wasn't showing any improvement. So you get objective, um, a lack of objective improvement, but subjective satisfaction. And we'll say more about that. Okay, fatigue is neither a symptom nor a diagnosis. It's a bodily state. And um, it, <clears throat> patients who are fatigued often have other problems. If you do a global rating like they do, um, you'll find that what most in, in, uh, impairs a pe person with chronic fatigue syndrome is not necessarily a fatigue. It could be the um, it could be the uh, the uh, uh, post um, exertion malaise. It could be the orthostatic. Uh, hypotension, stack intolerance. These are things that really interfere with people's lives. It could be the pain. Um, and um, I think the Dutch patients and the physicians need to appreciate if you do a study in the Netherlands of, of uh, cognitive behavior therapy or um, uh, graduate uh, exercise, it's inadmissible as evidence in the United States because the diagnostic criteria are too loose. Um, the, the Americans will not even, when they update their evaluations of treatments for chronic fatigue syndrome, they won't even consider a study from the Netherlands. So what happened was, the United, the, in the American government commissioned the Institute of Medicine report, and they emphasized that there needed to be more attention to post-exertional malaise and getting more ill after any effort with uh, ME. Now, we need to appreciate, in this controversy within the Netherlands, not all patients have ME who have chronic fatigue syndrome. It's a very loose definition. But for patients who do have ME, this is a defining symptom. And it's a symptom that we worsen if they exercise. That's very important. And it's also known, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, uh, PEM, but you can do an exercise test and, and, and a person will be fine immediately afterwards. It's only if, when you call them back a couple days later. And so you, the, a lot of the outcome data are illusory because it, it, they seem to be doing okay. And um, CDT and GET are no longer recognized by CDC. And the ARC, um, uh, that's the Agency for Health Care Research and Quality, will no longer accept uh, CBT GET studies based on the Oxford criteria, which are used in the UK and um, in the Netherlands. <coughs> the studies are inadmissible as evidence. <coughs> so what did the Dutch Health Council? They said that the IOM is corrupt and anybody can buy their way on. It's a very prestigious uh, group, and the, the head of the IOM wrote back an angry letter saying that nobody gets on, it, it's by election, and, and the criteria are very strict. Uh, they basically lie about the IOM. Okay, so um, this is a subgroup. Now, I've done a little bit of work in, with biomarkers in, in psychiatry. We have very few. And you don't get a biomarker for a condition. You get a subgroup that has some measurable biological abnormality. And then you look at that group. It's kind of a bootstrap effort. You find people who have that abnormality. That means you exclude some people. And then you, you see if there are other correlates. 
And I think that um, very promising uh, are some correlates of the um, measurements associated with the uh, post exertional malaise, but it won't be for all chronic fatigue patients. There'll be a subgroup. Okay. Okay. So it's. Um, Patients talk about a crash, a relapse. It's probably very familiar to the people in the room here. Uh, by the way, um, you can go um, to the web and you can buy the Institute of Medicine document for about $75. We can download it for free. Um, that's just the way they do things at the IOM. And I highly recommend this is a table that comes right out of it. It's an excellent table. Be armed. You need, you, need, you need to arm yourself if you're going to deal with the Dutch physicians. Okay, so here are the proposed criteria in student medicine. And there's the up in the left hand, that's a little, uh, that, that's from the website. You look that up and you, uh, you download the, the whole, not only can the 500 pages, whatever is you can download for free, we can get that. Uh, very uh, readable summaries too. So the diagnosis requires three symptoms, a substantial reduction or impairment in the ability to engage in pre clinical syllabus of um, occupational, educational, social, personal activities. Persist for six months accompanied by fatigue. But that's not enough. You have to have additional symptoms. Furthermore, you exclude major depression. If you don't, then you get a lot of patients who are just depressed. And there are different kinds of depression. There is some depression that are characterized by sadness, but there is some um, that uh, basically a, a, a lack of affect. It's called anhedonia. And a lot of those patients, they, um, they don't seem particularly sad. But if you interview them, not only do they, they, they have a lack of pleasure, but they also have uh, fatigue, they have uh, fatigue and non-restorative sleep. So it's a tough diagnosis, to, it's a tough separation. You have to spend time with patients, you have to get a history to make these distinctions. I don't believe that people should do exercise testing with patients uh, presented with, uh, suspected with chronic fatigue syndrome unless they do a careful history and to recognize the possibility of the damage being done. And it, it should only be done in the context of a, of a personal history. It's only interpretable in the context of personal history. And so the um, post-exertional malaise and um, uh, unrefreshing sleep, so those are required symptoms. All of them have to be present, but then at least one of the other two. And if you talk to a lot of the, um, the fatigue that uh, chronic fatigue patients experience, it's more of a mental fatigue, it's a fog. Um, and it's not necessarily, uh, it's cognitive impairment. They, they recognize they just can't process things. And they can tell you right away. And when you bother to ask, they'll describe it graphically. And then finally, the orthostatic intolerance. That's worth um, an explanation by itself. And that's very dramatic in, in some people. It's, it's subtle in others, but it's there. It's, um, it's basically when you stand up, you get really dizzy, um, sometimes faint, you can sweat, you get nauseated, and as soon as you lie down, it goes away. It can be really dramatic. Um, this came from Wikipedia. You uh, can find very elaborate explanations, but this was this was seemed damn good. You have to arm yourself. You have to educate yourself. I have a family member who has a, has an autoimmune disease. Certainly not chronic fatigue syndrome, but it took five years for her to be diagnosed, and she had to know her symptoms and her history better than all the specialists that she went to, and she became kind of like a walking medical record. And now they want to write her up 
Uh, and um, but the if she had been in the Netherlands, she probably would have got medically unexplained symptoms, and they would have stopped any kind of procedures. for a long time. We still don't have a biological test of major depression. We had a good one for a while until people started using it with mildly depressed patients. Dexamethasone depression test. We lost a one biomarker in, in depression when people started uh, over applying it. It should have been based on a, a biomarker is not a test you have or don't have. It's when knowing what you know does it add additional information. You shouldn't give it we actually used the dexamethasone suppression test on the unit where I was, and some of them the Hamilton. Yeah, so we had the Hamilton test, and we would give the dexamethasone suppression test. So what you do is you give some dexamethasone uh, at four o'clock, and the next day, the cortisol levels are really rising rather than being suppressed. Because normally the drug suppresses them, and so we thought, oh, well, that's cool. But then the residents started giving it to each other. And that was totally not allowed. But they found that a resident who didn't have a biological depression, if they had to have a grand rounds the next day, they looked like the depressed people. But the, the, the issue is you shouldn't give it to residents. You should give people you suspect they have melancholy. Does that make sense? And I, I think a lot of this idea of the search for biomarkers is confused. We've, we've never come on biomarkers just as a test you have, you don't have. Um, even glucose and tolerance. Looks like exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's something. So some of the, I would say, 40 percent of the women, uh, and they're mostly women on our ward, they they had a melancholic depression. That you needed different medication for. The other 60 percent probably had a character disorder, and that was and there was aggravating their depression, and that had to be addressed. But once you can rule that out, but they look the same until you, and still you start carefully going after the history. And then somebody said, well, what if, what if this, uh, we test for the uh, dexamethasone? And I think it was a valuable test for a while, and then we, they, we misused it. Okay. Um, so, CBT. The CBT they do in the Netherlands is not CBT. In the CBT, and let me jump ahead. That's Aaron Beck. He considers me one of his harshest critics. He once introduced me at a birthday party. He says, Coin over there is like a wolf wandering around our, 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 our herd of ideas, picking off the weak ones. Somebody needs to do it. Otherwise, they, it, it, the, the herd suffers. And so, um, um, I've written a couple papers with him, but I've also been as, as harsh as you could. And I've worked to work. to test the, the patient in their outside world, their life. 
they, you give them experiments to do. You don't tell the patient, you suffer from negative thinking. You inst instead, instead tell them to go out and do a task, and if they come back and they were pessimistic, then you say, do you think that you may have been unrealistic? And do you think that maybe you found out something different? It's very collaborative. You listen to the patient. They pick what they want to work on. That's not just with done CBT. Basically, it's like an exhortation. It's like having a marine sergeant get you moving. I suspect that if you were doing Beck style of CBT, a lot of the patients wouldn't pick the fatigue they wanted to work on. They'd pick out something that was more disruptive of their life. Okay, back when I was good, I uh, thought I was good, um, I, I, I had some principles. I still believe those are good principles. I, mean, I just, I, I don't think that I should get caught up in trying to get uh, uh, people moving again. But I collaborated. I, I talked about their strengths as well as their weaknesses. I accept their limitations. If anything, I would uh, restrain the patient from trying too hard so that I be with them. Rather than telling them, you had to go out and do this to say, no, I want to do this. And I said, hold on. Uh, and they would come in, this was great. I said, well, we've been up swinging the cycle. Uh, I don't get caught up in therapeutic enthusiasm. And so it was a matter of, of not fighting with the patient if you, if you were mildly resisting your efforts. And you adapted to the readiness to work. And you achieved limited goals. Nothing, nothing like um, what's done in cognitive therapy here. And the biopsychosocial model, I get so upset. What everybody, the rest of the world means by that, okay, so I borrowed this slide from the front, and this is the biopsychosocial model in the rest of the world. So you see the three. So what's very important about this model it introduces psychology where it's, where it's been missing so far. So in managing diabetes, you sometimes need to think about the patient, how you get adherence. You need to think about how adhering to the regimen fits in their life. But very clearly, um, it's not a replacement for medical treatment. It is the Netherlands. So when I said, tell people, I'm going to go attack the, bi the biopsychosocial model in the Netherlands, that makes sense to the Dutch people, but in the United States, they say, why do you want to do that? That's a good model. It's the different model. It's entirely different. Does that, does that make sense? That you take the account that not only is there a disease, but there's a patient who has a disease, and the patient has a context. And you need to influence that patient. You need to get their trust, and you need to have a relationship with them. Because sometimes when you work with a patient, it needs to matter more to them to please you than, than to look after themselves. They don't want to let you down. I used to work with HIV patients, um, and we used to um, <coughs> teach them problem solving. And they sometimes would say, you know, that all this, these things we have to do to keep our adherence going, that was important. But that woman was so nice, would call us on the phone. And I knew she'd get in trouble with you guys if I didn't do what I had to do. See, that's the biopsychosocial model. See what I mean? Does that make sense? That we would try and teach them problem solving to adhere to the HIV medication. What were the barriers to that? The patients thought that this is a really nice woman who's really trying hard, and she's not like the infectious disease doctors. And that psychologist with them, oh. They were protecting our research assistant from us by increasing their adherence. And we, we, we kept uh, track of the adherence with the men's caps. We actually got, to, not only did we get increased adherence, we got reduced viral load. It was based on the relationship, it was based on the psychosocial model. Not saying that the psychosocial model drives HIV, AIDS, but it's part of the context. And people get so upset with me in the United States when I say, I'm going to go attack VPS. Because they say, we're going to kick the, you know, the, that's the basic support of what we're doing. That gives us a presence in our patients' lives. Stop it. Okay. Um, 
ME is not mumps. If you go through the history of people with even MS, it takes years of medical contact before you arrive at a diagnosis. And you, when you decide that it is medically unexplained symptoms, you stop looking further. This is a horrible, I, uh, I got this from uh, 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 Pure Fink's group. They have, a little, uh, they have a little pamphlet they give out explaining that uh, you only have medically unexplained symptoms. And I, you can look up uh, my blog, you look up uh, Point Around, my blog, and uh, he complained to uh, Close because they, he said I was uh, libeling him uh, by attributing ridiculous ideas to him. I, I showed where they were direct folks. Huh? He was the person who imprisoned that yeah, patient in the. Yeah, yeah. He came to speak working? on October 30th in the United States. The patients protested yeah. in the United States. He's spreading his um, his model. Uh, I forget exactly. what he called it. He's got some special scale that's rubbish. So my blog about him is um, uh, psychother uh, psychotherapy for whatever ails your physician about you. Because it emphasized that one of the criteria for medically unexplained symptoms is that um, the um, physician had to believe that your concerns were exaggerated um, or that you were obsessed with them. And so you had to really, one of the criteria is that your patients, you basically had an unsympathetic physician. Okay. Um, we want to go to, let's see. Okay. Oh, that's the, I, I already said that. Uh, that's the, the example of the woman, uh, the two women crying in the back of the room. That was really moving. It's so hard to break out, though, because the patients and their, advoc their, their uh, advocates are so stigmatized. Um, there were a lot of reprisals for me having gotten involved in this. They took away my blog uh, at close uh, because they said there was conflict of interest that I continued to blog about the PACE trial while, while I, they were involved in legal action, trying to hold withhold their data from me. And when I wrote about it anyway, they took my blog away. Um, and you're up against a powerful enemy. So the close one told me, they said, back off, Jim. We'll get you the data by December. We'll have it. Just be quiet. Don't blog anything more about it. And so they actually, I think at that time, they weren't lying. They believed they would. And then they started getting threatened by the PACE investigators. And so I kept pestering them. And so then they said, OK, um, we will put an expression of concern on the, um, on the, on the paper, or it would be the first step to retracting it. They sued, and they stopped that. The, the close one had a full procedure release data. They, did, they, they, they got expensive lawyers, and they never released them. I went after them uh, at, at the Cochran collaboration, tried to get them to release some of the data for their uh, analyses for, about the exercise. And um, I had an award from the Cochran collaboration, the Bill Silverman Prize. They, they give it to people who are annoying and keep it up and force them to do things differently. I said, give you back that $1,000. I just want the data. And they, they, they hesitate, and then they say no. And then there was the so-called uh, withdrawal of the Cochrane exercise review. Um, two patients, one of them uh, died as uh, consumed by the effort, uh, uh, while Co uh, uh, um, Yeah, yeah. And, um, and then uh, Tom Kinnaman, pretty, he really, it, it took a real toll on him. Um, Bob died by suicide uh, when he was, uh, after being involuntarily hospitalized. Um, but, 
But at any rate, so they they kept pestering Cochrane that this this is an re inadequate review, and they finally got it. And I kept badgering Cochrane, saying it's conflict of interest, and I kept a duel with the, the senior editor of Cochrane in, the, in blogs. We have dueling blogs going back and forth. They finally decided the patients were right, and the, the, they were going to withdraw the review. And that's a big deal because they rarely withdraw a review unless the patient, unless the authors ask for it. And no way did the patient authors want to do it. So what what they do? They now say it's just going to sit there indefinitely. They're not going to do anything more. And it's just going to be a little warning label, uh, but it'll probably still be used for treatment decisions. So that they can reverse. And um, they're ugly tactics. I, I had to look up vexatious because I, you know, I, it's not a word I normally use, but Trudy Calder, who still owes me a dinner, went before this tr uh, tribunal and said I was being vexatious. And I had to look that up. That means that I was just being, I was just asking for the data to be annoying. And there's a lot of tone policing going on. You need to understand these tactics. What tone policing is, if you get upset about something because it matters to you, rather than deal with the issue that you're raising as a patient, they deal with the fact you're upset. And they neutralize you. And they keep focusing on that. Your upset patients. And then gaslighting. Gaslighting psychological manipulation. You end up doubting your own sanity. Did I really say that? Was I, did I get over emotional? And you question your memory, your perception, and your sin. And um, it, it, <clears throat> the people using it against you, they deny. You see the Dutch uh, uh, Health Council deny your concerns. They misdirect. They contradict you. And they don't like lying. Gaslight was, is one of the recommended words of the year. Um, and I think it's become into promise because people recognize that it's, it's being widely used. So, you know, I kind of pre-hate it. Um, uh, <clears throat> they it, were able to off me from the, um, from the meeting uh, because I was a nasty person. I, uh, it's okay. Um, um, you know, I've had my career, I wrote 400 papers, I'm tired of writing papers. And now I'm going to cash it in and I'm going to be annoying. And um, thank you for coming to listen to me be annoying. Thank you. I had some other slides, but and one of them acknowledged uh, Frank and, uh, and Anil. Anil's a very important uh, influence on me. People know Anil. He's a, uh, he's a ballet dancer, and he um, he writes some incredibly good blogs. Some of them I envy. I wish I had written them because he, he does it very carefully. He looks at the, uh, scientific issues, and um, we we have correspond back and forth. Like a lot of patients, you never get to meet him. I've never met him. We talked about me, uh, meeting him sometime. I already said uh, it, 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 the. Um, I, I couldn't take it and send me to another crash. He says, I got a friend, you can go have a beer with him, and he'll tell you about me, but don't come see me. And that's what you deal with the patient actors, the voice field. Um, Tom Kindle in the same way. I said, I'm coming to Ireland. I'm, I'm pot Irish, you know? I said, so, uh, that's good, but uh, 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 I'll give you some suggestions when you go, but uh, don't come see me. <coughs> There's obviously a group of psychologists that, you know, they're kind of teamed up and they have their own views and um, and you're kind of like um, <coughs> trying to uh, yeah, challenge them, of course. And are, do you also have uh, a support system behind you that can... Limited. I'm kind of alone. <coughs> okay. I think of myself sometimes like a, a, a sniper in the tree and I get a group of patients who advise me. And they pass me the email. They, 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 they have command, command of the literature. And you know, I may have like six or eight people back me up, and two of them are functioning that day because you know they're all they're worked up about it and they have uh, they have crashes. And I, I just try picking off targets. And I'm hated for doing that. 
Um, but, uh, and Michael Schott really sees me as, as someone capable of doing some real damage. So does Simon Wesley. Perhaps following up on, on your question, um, do you, from your time, you spent some time in this country, and I'm sure you have a network of colleagues, are there some colleagues that you think could be perfect allies in this? Uh, some of the journalists, some of the journalists get <coughs> Some people who don't do enough, but could do more. It, it's, it's, it's hard. Um, yeah, um, people are afraid to get involved in this controversy. The patients are <coughs> present so ugly. Um, you know, there's a, there's a movie called I Am Not Your Negro, and it's by James Baldwin. And it's about, it's about a, a, <coughs> an African American going to uh, Cambridge and feeling offended by the way he was treated. And he, he said the original version was not I'm Not Your Negro. But um, basically, it's a wonderful movie challenging the way they treat people. And I think that um, uh, there's a lot of characteristics the same, the way the attitude of the elite towards the um, patients. And the patients are a front to them because they were drained on resources. One of the things that really offended me is in the UK, Peter White had the uh, handicapped parking passes taken away from the patients when they come to clinics because they need to get out and walk. Yeah. That is so offensive. Isn't that called the compassionate withholding of the sentence? Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. That was all politics, that. I, again, I, I have no, no one in my background is crime takes, but I grew up on, 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 on welfare. And my mother was able bodied, but she had to take care of uh, my stepbrother, half brother, was basically living as a vegetable. For 13 years, he couldn't move his. Uh, his own bowels or uh, eat food, and um, and so she had to take care of him. And there was a lot of flack we got about being an able-bodied woman. And um, so I, I'm sensitive to uh, these these issues about taking people's pains uh, away from them. And that's the whole deal in the Netherlands and the deal in the UK. They don't care that the treatment doesn't work. They want to say, go to the treatment, or you're not doing all that you can do. That's what it's about, and that's what's really sick. And you know, old guy, and uh, a little bit of fight left to me, and uh, keep fighting. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Everyone, uh, I just wanted to thank you for coming and uh, staying. I know it's uh, a bit late, but. I better get to the train station. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so uh, take care. Uh, have a great evening. Um, before you leave, um, I just want to thank you one more time, and also thank you to uh, the staff of uh, Red Carpet Lounge for uh, staying with us uh, throughout the evening and uh, helping us. Um, yeah, so hopefully, and thank uh, you, Roland. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, please, uh, contact me, email me if you uh, yeah want to keep in touch or have any follow-up questions. Uh, I've done quite a few screenings uh, in the past year. And uh, I still keep in touch with a lot of people that I've met, so that's been a really nice uh, experience for me as well. So, uh, okay, thank you again. Have a great evening. Thank you.